I always like to start my presentations with a question. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have people in your agencies who struggle with making good decisions? Anybody? Anybody here? Okay, good, good, good. I'm in the right place. How many of you are that person? Like my chief's sitting in the back and he's like, Trent, I can think of a few decisions that I'm questioning your ability. So how many of you think that if we could find a way to help our people make better decisions, that we might have better outcomes? Can we all get on board with that? Yes. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. But there's a problem, and it's a really big problem. Because these guys, actually every one of us, let me get the presenter work. Operator Aaron. That way. Thank you very much. The, the, the uh, <coughs> virtual goblin has gotten everybody. It's all good. No, this is, this is my fault. This is operator here. here. It's the nut behind the control. <laughs> but every person that you work with in your agency, including yourself, makes 35,000 decisions a day. That sounds ridiculous, right? I didn't believe it when I first read it, but I trust the scientists, and I feel really bad for the research assistant who had to sit there and count, is that a decision, is that a decision? I don't know how they got to this number. But the thing is, is that there are a lot of decisions. And so not all of these decisions are things that you're consciously doing. A lot of these decisions are things that you automate. And one thing about decisions is, is that decisions cost a tremendous amount of focus and energy. Every decision that you have to put effort into, it takes something away. And so knowing this and knowing how many decisions you have to make, you can see that your brain has to develop a way with handling all of these decisions. So for an example, you don't decide typically which way you're gonna to go to work each day, right? You typically kind of just take the same route because that's one of those things that you don't wanna think about too much. But then you get stuck in traffic and you have to reroute and all of a sudden you just gotta start making decisions and you're, you, you don't know where you're at and you're fiddle farting around with your GPS and all of a sudden you cause stress and you gotta waste time and energy making these decisions. And so when we think about all of the time and energy that's expended making these decisions, it creates this phenomenon. And the phenomenon is called decision fatigue. And this is an actual thing. And the idea of decision fatigue is, is that the more decisions that you make, the poorer quality decisions you will be able to make. Decision fatigue is very much like willpower. If you think about decision fatigue in terms of willpower, think about if you're really, really trying to start a new diet, and you really, really, really have to focus hard, right, on making good choices, and it's really tiring, and it's really exhausting, and then something happens in your day and you decide, oh, the heck with it, I'm gonna eat the donut or I'm gonna eat the Snickers bar. And then what does every decision look like after that? Well, I ate the donut, so hell, I might as well go get beer and pizza next, right? So this is cascading effect. So making these decisions, using this energy, it's sucked away from us. Think about, think about the donuts when they, when they put them in the break room. If you're having a good day, if you just did some exercise and you had a healthy breakfast and you're like, oh, there's free donuts in the break room. It's not that hard to ignore them if you don't really want them. But if you're tired, you got off an extra job last night, or you're stressed out, you have a real hard time going, oh, donuts, it's exactly what I need. This is what decision fatigue is. In my family, we order pizza every Friday night. Because my wife's a school teacher, and I'm a, police, I'm a police major, so by Friday night, we are wasted. We have no mental energy, we just have a standing order with peace, love, and pizza. And that's what we do, because we don't want to make any more decisions. We don't want to think about what it is that we have to eat. Think about those days when you've been extremely busy at work, and you've made decision after decision after decision, and you get home and you're exhausted, and you know, like, I need to go to the gym, or I need to go spend time with my kid, or I need to take him to the park, or whatever, but you just collapse on the couch, and you start binging Netflix. That ever happened to anybody? It happens to me every once in a while, right? And so the problem gets even worse. So when you think about decision fatigue, you think about the number of decisions that people are asked to make, 
And then you think about what I've heard is the best dis definition of policing. And I actually think this applies to public safety in general. The best definition I've ever heard is judgment, decision making, and problem solving. And so when you think about what we do in public safety, we use our best judgment to make decisions in order to solve problems for other people. So how are we going to make good decisions when we're already behind the eight ball? How are we going to overcome the fact that we're, we're, we're so stressed out with other people's problems, then we put our own problems on top of them. How are we going to develop this ability? Does anybody wonder why when our officers go out and handle calls, they get short with people? Because they're stressed out by the volume of decisions that they've had to make. And so I think we can all agree that if we could get officers to slow things down and make more patient decisions when they're out on calls, same thing on fire calls, same thing in EMS, same thing in dispatch, if we could get people to slow down and make more patient decisions, that we could get them better results that we're looking for. Now I said that judgment, decision making, and problem solving is the best definition of police work I've ever heard, but this is actually the, the best decision. Best definition. <laughs> now you can see why we can't really teach that to people, but it, it really is appropriate. So it was really just so I could drink water. I had to put that in there. I talk a lot. So, so judging. So now we go with judgment, decision making, and problem solving. We're moving through there. I'm going the wrong direction. Presenter. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. So this becomes even more of a problem when you move from a position of service provider in the organization to a leadership position. When you become a boss, making good decisions becomes even more important. And why is that? When I'm just out there answering my calls, when I'm out there just taking the calls on the phone, when I'm out there just going to those, those, those EMS calls, I'm responsible for me. I'm responsible for my decisions. But when you become a leader in an organization, you become responsible for other people's decisions as well. And you become responsible for how they make those decisions, you, you become responsible for the quality of those decisions. So it's very, very important that you start to learn, you start to empower your people, and you start to equip them with the ability to make better decisions. But it's a struggle because in most lines of work, the way we look at our job causes us a problem. When you're in the service providing business, when you're at the, when you're at the line level, typically the way you look at your job is through the lens of activity. What things do I have to do? I, I have to answer my calls. I have to do my paperwork. I have to go where dispatch sends me. I have to go to this EMS call. I have to service my vehicles. All of these things that I have to do. I have to do my paperwork. But when you're thinking about your job only in terms of activities, it becomes disconnected from why we're here. And so this is why you have to look at your job in terms of the results that you're trying to achieve. And the results that we're trying to achieve, those point to our purpose. And so when you become a boss, you have to look at your job in terms of purpose. Now, in our agency, you have, you have what basically you can look at your activities as the things that are in your job description. And if, you're, if you do the things that are in your job description, you'll be pretty successful, right? Like you show up, you answer your calls, you get your paperwork in on time, you'll be pretty successful. But if all you're ever concerned about is the things that are within your job description, you won't get very far and you certainly won't be able to help people as a leader. So you have to develop that ability to focus on results. And so we have a line in the back, in the bottom, the last line of all of our job descriptions, which is really what I call my job description, which is other duties as assigned. And the chief will tell you that like, that's basically how we handle things in the, in the agency. There's a lot of things where that's where the results get done, the other duties as assigned. It's all of the stuff that's in between the job description. Now, President Eisenhower, he looked at this problem in a little bit different way this activity versus results problem. Hmm. 
Today we're going to move to. President Eisenhower understood that there were two kinds of issues in an, or in an organization. There were urgent issues and there were important issues, but they're almost never the same thing. And so the urgent issues are the activities, they're the things that we do. They're actually really easy to deal with because they just present themselves to you. But the important things are the things that are gonna make the organization better. They're the things that are gonna connect with the purpose of the organization. They're the things that are gonna let your officers understand the why of what they do. And so basically what, what President Eisenhower is describing here is what we call firefighting. And this is typically what we do in our organizations is we fight fires. And by fighting fires, what I mean is, is we show up to work and we just wait for people to bring the problems to us or whatever problem it is. If you're on patrol, hey, this is easy. All I do is answer my calls. If you're in a leadership position, somebody says, oh, so-and-so was late for work or so-and-so wrecked their car or so-and-so broke this piece of equipment. And then you wait to handle those things. And so what that does to you is it creates a reactive mindset. And when you get into a reactive mindset, this is where you really start to fall behind and where you really start to fail. Because when you answer that email, the second that it's sent to you, you're responding to somebody else's priorities, aren't you? When you get those emails, those urgent emails, or just any emails, hey, what about this? Hey, can you do this? Hey, can you help me with this? Are those the things that, that you're focused on that you need to accomplish that day, or are they typically things that other people need help with? Yeah, yeah, and, and why do they do that? Because they want you to take their work away from them, right? A lot of those people want to take your work away from them. And so we struggle as bosses because we feel like we're obligated to help them with those things. But this is that old, the old idea of giving a person the fish versus teaching them how to fish. And so we have to get out of this firefighting mode. So let's look at how we can solve this problem, how we can get out of this reactive mode and start getting into proper decision making. So the first thing we need to do is we need to understand what it is to make a decision. And CIS, C-I-S, is the Latin root for the word decision. C-I-D-E is the Latin root for decide. And what that means is to cut away. So a homicide is to cut away a human life, right? A suicide is to cut away my own life. The, um, an exorcism is to remove an evil spirit. And a decision is to remove other options. So we're actually removing choices. And so once you understand that you need to make decisions in order to remove other choices, then your first decision has to be, do I need to make this decision? When people are bringing things to you, you have to ask yourself, is this my decision to make or would somebody else be better served if they could do it? And so here's how we're gonna do that. I'm gonna give you a few quick ways in order to help you solve that problem. The first one is the Pareto Principle. Anybody ever heard of it? Raise your hand. Most of you might know it as the 80-20 Principle. And basically, for those of you who don't know, is the Pareto Principle is, it says nothing more than 80% of your results, or 80% of the outputs of any system are the result of 20% of the, the inputs or the efforts. So to think about that in terms of your job, 20% of the decisions you make will give you 80% of the results that you're looking for. 20% of the people in your agency do 80% of the work. Is that correct? 20% of the people in your agency cause 80% of your problems. Does that make sense? So this is a natural law. And in terms of leadership, the, the only law that probably has more relevance on your day to day is gravity. And so think about the Pareto Principle in terms of deciding what decisions are gonna give me the most return on investment. And then we gotta figure out how to give the rest of those decisions away. And the next step in figuring that out is what's called the Eisenhower Matrix. Has anybody not seen this before? Has anybody seen this before? I guess I should ask. A few people have seen it. I, when I first saw this, it kind of, I was like, ah, it's too prescriptive. You know, but the idea behind this is you have two axes here. You have an axis of importance and you have an axis of urgency. 
And so every decision that you make is going to fall somewhere on this matrix. Everything that you do is going to fall somewhere on this matrix. And so what most people do is that they will spend all of their time in either quadrant one or quadrant, we'll call this quadrant three down here on the bottom. Because these are the things that are urgent. They're pressing for your attention right now. And some of those things you have to do. Up here in quadrant one, which urgent and important, and the things that are urgent and important, those are the things that if you don't do them, you'll get fired. So it's important to do those things and to do them quickly and to do them well. But the place where everybody skips is over here in the true quadrant two. These are the things that are important, but they're not urgent. These are the things where if you can learn to focus your energy, you will change your organization. These are things like planning. These are things like personal growth and personal development. These are things like equipping conversations with your people. This is coaching. This is mentoring. This is spending time in conversations, getting in sync with your people. And so I don't use this as a prescriptive thing. What I've chosen to do is I use this as a filter or a funnel. And so when activities or decisions are thrown my way or when things people are asking me for things to do, what I ask myself in my head is, does this fall in quadrant one or quadrant two up here? And if it falls in quadrant one or quadrant two, I will do something with it because these are important and they're productive. If it falls in quadrant three down here, I'm going to find somebody else. To do. I'm going to find somebody else who has that capability. I know what you're thinking, you're like, well, I can't just give away my job. You actually can. And, and, and actually, you would be a lot more successful if you did more often. And you have to think about it not in terms of shirking your responsibility, but you have to think about it in terms of empowering and equipping the people beneath you. We've talked over and over, and you've heard today, people, what's your legacy going to be? What's your succession plan? It's got to be in here. You've got to give your people the reps at these things down here. So this stuff down here in the avoid quadrant, that's like Nintendo, PlayStation, you know, Netflix. Those are the things you gotta try, you gotta try to minimize those and avoid them. They're fun and they give us a break, but you gotta try to avoid them as much as you can. So just remember that these are the places where you wanna spend your time, and particularly if you can get it to here, you'll be mostly effective. Now I put this one out of order, sort of for a reason, so that you can understand. If you start your day the right way, you develop and you set up the mindset for your day. And so by starting your day the right way, what I mean is you've got to schedule those quadrant two activities, those things that have to be planned in advance that are going to help you be successful. And so for an example, I'll use myself as an example because I'm the only person I know here. Um, my, the beginning of my day, I wake up. I wake up very early. The coffee pot's already brewing by the time I get up. And I spend the first hour of my day reading because that's how I'm going to self, that's how I'm going to improve myself. And that, I get that done. That's just me a proactive mindset. I'm out there seeking out new information. Then when I get done with my call from my reading, I go do my PT. And then once I get done with my PT, then my kids are awake and I start getting them ready for school. But before my kids are even awake, I've already accomplished two things that are important to me and that are increasing my capacity as a leader. Increasing my capacity, it's important. So you have to start your day the right way. And then once you start your day the right way, you have to find your most important thing that you're gonna do for the day. And by most important thing, I mean the one thing that if you accomplish it that day, work-related, family-related, whatever it is, your day is gonna be a success. Because life is gonna throw us a lot of decisions and it's gonna throw us a lot of curveballs. But what most people do and what most people fail at is they come into work with a to-do list, right? And you'll have a to-do list of six or seven things. And as the day goes back and forth, you'll bounce from one thing to the next thing on your to-do list. You get interrupted. You don't return to the same thing. And then by the end of the day, none of your six things is done. So you can either do one thing very well and get it completed, or you can do two, three, six things poorly and get none of them completed. And it's the people who can complete tasks and who can accomplish the mission who will generate personal success for themselves. And just on this point, and I want to make it real quick, part of the myth 
or part of the reason that people don't just focus on one thing is they think that it's not enough. And I can tell you from experience that it is. If you can accomplish one thing a day, you will be well ahead of most people. Most people don't accomplish the whole heck of a lot. But the other thing is, is there's this allure to multitasking. Everybody's like multitasking this, multitasking that. Neuroscience has already proven that multitasking is a lot. It's not multitasking. What's actually happening is task switching. You're going back and forth, back and forth, and you're giving neither task proper attention. Texting while driving. That's, that's, my, that's my case study right there. I mean, everybody in this room should know that texting while driving, it's basically the same as driving drunk because you can't multitask. You're switching back and forth, you're focusing on the road and focusing on the text. So focus on that one thing. And I just want to leave you with this. When we're talking about leadership, we're talking about going somewhere. Leadership means that we're on a journey together and that we're going somewhere together. And as a leader, you can't take me somewhere you've never been. So if you want me to make better decisions, if you want me to slow down and think about what I'm doing, you've got to show me the way. And the way you're gonna do that is actually by giving up some of the decisions that you're currently making and empowering and equipping the people who you serve with to help you out. Thank you very much.